a fresh review. That way you all can catch up and know what's going on. The book of Hebrews, we don't know who the author is, but the best prospect is the Apostle Paul. We believe it's the Apostle Paul who's writing the book of Hebrews during a time before he was given revelation about Christian doctrine, which we call the body of Christ, the revelation about the body of Christ. So he is still being introduced to this. He is new. All Paul knows is Jewish doctrine related to the tribulation, okay? Jewish doctrine related to end times. So the book of Hebrews, you're going to have to keep in mind, what it's about is mostly about Hebrews, the Jews. So it's written to Jews, and there's a lot of tribulation doctrine here. So there's going to be verses here that do not apply to Christians. That's important to understand. They're going to pull up verses where you can lose your salvation, where you have to endure to the end, you have to do faith and works. That is not Christian doctrine. Remember that. We do not believe in that. There are Christian churches who try to tell you that the book of Hebrews is applied to you in losing salvation, in doing works for salvation. Ignore that. They are wrong. That's heresy. Right. Majority of wrong, I hope you're listening, okay? So that way you can not get lost. There's the majority of wrong doctrine that you hear in churches will be from this book of Hebrews, okay? Yeah. Hebrews is one of those books. Yep. There's also Acts, and then there's also the book of Matthew. But anyway, Hebrews is one of the number one books that they'll use. So there's a lot of heresies. So remember, this is end-time Jews. But because Paul is being introduced Christian doctrine, Paul mingled Christian doctrine here, all right? He doesn't yet know the distinction of Jew and Christian church yet. That's very possible, which is why he's writing about Christian doctrine here, and he's assuming that's for tribulation Jews. So, when we look at the book of Hebrews, you're going to see verses that you're going to go, wait, that sounds Christian to me, though. Well, it's because the tribulation Jews, they're going to have some Christian stuff, too. They're going to have some Christian stuff, too. And Paul, he's thinking that that is for tribulation Jews. But Paul doesn't know what God knows. God knows that that right. part, what you wrote, Paul, it can work for tribulation Jews, but you don't know it yet. That's going to be more Christian. And when you look at the Pauline epistles, Romans to Philemon, you're going to notice that some of the Christian verses in Hebrews that matches with the Pauline epistles, those are for Christians. Okay? So remember, Paul is still being new to this. How we know it's Christian or tribulation Jew is because we already got all the Bible, see? So because we got all the Bible, we can tell. Okay, that's going to be tribulation Jew, that's going to be Christian, okay? All right, so now that you understand all this, it's important to keep in mind that when we look at the verse in Hebrews, there's always going to be double application. In other words, it's going to apply to tribulation Jew, tribulation Jew. But there will be sometimes verses that can also apply to Christians. So there can be one verse in Hebrews that can apply both to Jew in the tribulation and the Christian. Yep. Okay, that can happen. That can happen. Uh, for example, if the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that verse, mm -hmm. we know that Paul is writing that to Christians in the book of Romans, mm -hmm. but couldn't that verse work also with tribulation Jews? Yeah. Of course, because everyone's a sinner. Uh -huh. Couldn't that verse also work with Old Testament mm -hmm. Jews? Right. Of course, because everyone's a sinner. So see, that's the idea. You're going to have to have that kind of mindset when you look at Hebrews, okay? Whenever you see a verse, it's going to be tribulation Jew, but you're going to go, wait a minute, that can work with Christians. That's what you're going to find out, okay? Yeah. All right, so we all follow along? Yeah. All right, now go to Hebrews 4. Let's begin, all right? We're going to have a lot of fun here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. And then verse 12. All right, the Word of God. So uh, most of this will be simple tonight, so don't worry, all right? So most of this will be simple tonight. For the Word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. In Hebrews 4.12, the author writes that the, wor the Word of God, which is the Bible, is alive. That's what quick means, and powerful, it's strong, it has power, and then it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That's self-explanatory. It's a sword. And the reason why the Apostle Paul is writing about this, let's go by the context. Remember chapter 4, uh, the Apostle is writing to those Jews that they have to labor, they have to work hard combined with their faith for salvation because of the tribulation time. So the tribulation time, please remember this, don't confuse this, so I hope you're paying attention. Faith and works for salvation is tribulation only, okay? For Jews in tribulation. That is not you and me, okay? I hope everyone gets that. I don't want somebody to tell me yeah. after Bible study, Thank you for telling me that we can lose our salvation. I have to do works to keep my faith. No, no, I never said that. I said that was for Jews in tribulation. Okay? Our salvation is not by works, faith alone. Okay? And we can never lose salvation. I want to make that very clear because for some of you who are first time here in Hebrews class, I don't want you to get confused. So the author is telling them, that it's important that they have to keep their life clean then, see, with faith and works for salvation. So he's talking about the Bible here at verse 12. And he's going to talk about that the Bible is a sharp sword. It's an offensive weapon. That it's so sharp that it can dig down to the inner thoughts. So you can't hide your sin. See, so during the tribulation, those Jews, they really have to have a lot of faith and works because they're going to be judged for it at the judgment. The Bible will judge them for their sins. So that's very important to understand. When we go to uh, Revelation 20, go to Revelation chapter 20. And Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Notice that there is a judgment for tribulation Jews. Tribulation Jews, they're going to face judgment, which is after the tribulation. This is after the tribulation time. Notice that we're looking at the book of Revelation, right? So this is long after the tribulation. Notice that there's going to be a judgment for tribulation Jews or tribulation saints. Let's start off with Revelation chapter 11. And then... Uh, We'll start off at verse uh, 18, 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. So notice right here, this is the end of the tribulation, when the dead are judged. So that's the great white throne judgment. We're going to look at that later, all right, at Revelation 20 that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants. Oh, look at that. So God's servants will be at this great white throne judgment. They're going to be judged here. The prophets and to the saints. See, tribulation saints. And them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Okay, look how this matches with Revelation 20. It's the time of the dead being judged for their works. Their works, and if their works are not good, they go to hell. Okay, so this is a good works salvation system. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. See, this is the great white throne judgment. And him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So the tribulation is over. This is the end time, all right? This is the end of the end. And I saw the dead. See that? Time of the dead, like we looked at before. Small and great. Remember, Revelation 11 said small, right? And great. Stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? Works. So notice right here that the, uh, you want to remember this. The books, whatever books are, judging them. So the books are judging them on their works. That's why it's a faith and works system, salvation for tribulation Jews. 
Okay, let's go back to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. What are those books? Well, you're going to find out, and I'll explain it a little later on. But what we saw so far is verse 12, for the Word of God, right? So it's the Bible. But it said books right here. Why is that? Dr. Ruckman mentioned, which is very interesting, he believes that it's going to be those 66 books. Because remember, the Bible consists of 66 books. So then he believes it's going to be those 66 books at the Great White Throne Judgment that will judge the works of those people. Now, there's no doubt that it is the Bible because of Hebrews 4.12 and then other verses, all right? We're going to see that. So just keep that swimming in your head. We're going to come back to that and prove it. But let's talk about the Bible here, that it's an offensive sword, right? So let's go to Ephesians 6. The Bible is a sword. You want to remember that. That is the only offensive weapon you have in your spiritual warfare. So if the devil is attacking you, if you got enemies in your life, if you are not reading your Bible, you're not memorizing your verses, if you're not studying the Bible, that's why in church we come here to study the Bible. Right. We preach the Bible. If you're not growing in that, you lost your only offensive weapon. Mm -hmm. Then what's going to happen with the world, the flesh and the devil, all that crashing on you? Yeah, You've got nothing yeah. to fight them off and you're in trouble. If you think you can do it through your sheer willpower and, oh. you know, you got good health and you got good heart and, you know, I just got a strong mind. No, you're going to crack. You're going to crack. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6. Notice right here in verse uh, 17, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See? Right. The Bible is your sword. Okay, go back. Go back. Now, notice right here, it's this sharper than any two-edged sword. So, in other words, it's a double-edged sword. Now, you know what that phrase means, right? That means, listen, the Bible can be a great asset or a great stumbling block. Mm -hmm. Okay? Why? Because this is God's book. When you touch that book, when you touch that sword, it can be a great weapon, but it's so dangerous you can cut yourself if you're not careful. And people think they can mess with that book. Do you mess with a dangerous weapon? No, you don't play with that. You don't play with a dangerous weapon. You're going to hurt yourself. Why are there Bible critics, Bible scholars, playing with that book? Come on. Oh, this should be corrected right here. Oh, the interpretation of this verse should mean and all that. They, you know what they've done? They cut their, they slit their own throats. So notice right here, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. That book is a dangerous book, friend. You don't mess with that book. That's why we preach hard against people who play with that book. Because you know what they're doing? They're cutting their throats and they're making their people who listen to them cut their own throats too. That's why we make a big deal about modern Bible versions. Why? Because they're playing with words in the Bible to their interpretation, what they think is a better translation and all that. What they're doing, they're cutting their own throats. And they're allowing their readers to cut themselves. That's a horrible thing. That should be preached against. That's serious. Right. Second Peter chapter 3, verse, seven, uh, verse 16. 2 Peter 3, 16. Amen. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, what? Unto their own destruction. Look at that. You can rest. You can twist. You can play with that book where it will destroy you. That's what the verse says. You know what the Bible does? It's your offensive weapon where you can destroy others, but at the same time, you just don't know it. You destroy yourself. That's something to think about. It's a powerful book. Okay, let's go to, uh, back to our main text. Let's go back to our main text. Now, in Hebrews, uh, remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word in the verse. That way you all can understand the whole thing, okay? So the middle of verse 12, 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So in other words, the Bible pierces, its blade is so sharp, it pierces so deeply that it even divides, it separates completely. That's what asunder is, like just completely, powerfully, the soul and spirit. So notice right here, the Bible is so sharp, it can divide that soul and spirit. It's that sharp. Now, a lot of people think that soul and spirit are, uh, are the same thing because when you look at the Bible, soul and spirit is quite often mentioned together. Um, but we do know that they're different. And the verse right here says that it's so sharp that even though you would think that they're closely intertwined like many other people think, the Bible is so sharp it can divide it separately. It can divide us separately. You might say, why? Because a lot of times uh, when there are issues that deal with the soul, the Bible will show you that. And when there are issues of the spirit, the Bible will show you that. It's so sharp. It's so powerful in its word. You can tell what is spiritual and what would apply to you soul-wise or psychologically. Mm, wow. So that's how powerful it is. Um, one, one quick example was Sunday sermon, right? I explained the difference of body, soul, and spirit. But it was simply a man's preaching of that book. Can you imagine if the book itself you were reading, That's right. what it would tell you? It's even much more powerful. Yeah. So this is proof that soul and spirit is not the same. This is the verse you want to mark down, proving that soul and spirit is not the same. People keep saying they're the same, they're not. The next verse you want to write down is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. That verse proves that the body is not the same as a soul. So Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists com confuse yeah. the two. Would you believe that? They think that when you die, your soul sleeps yeah. because they confuse your body yeah. sleeping in the grave with your soul. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they think. So no, body is different from soul and soul is different from spirit and those three are not the same. Right. All right, go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body. See that? They're separated. All right, go back to Hebrews 4. Go back to Hebrews 4. In verse 12, the next part of verse 12 says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. So that book is so sharp, it can divide even, you know how close the joints are with the marrow, right? But they're different, they're separated. So sharp, it can uh, divide between it. Now, what is it meaning right here? It could mean that there are things uh, within your joint and marrow, or maybe it's a, metaphor, it's a figurative expression that there's something in you that the, Lord, that the Word of God can discern and tell the difference. That's what it could mean. Or it could mean more literally, because believe it or not, that Word of God is going to cut down the body, actually. Yeah. It's going to tear apart the body, and that happens at Armageddon. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, come on. So go to Revelation uh, 19. <laughs> Revelation 19. Yeah, that Word of God can be more literal than you think. It will yeah. cut you down. Amen. It will cut you down. Oh, yeah. It's something in the spirit yeah. world, but it could probably become are present in the physical realm. It could probably become that. The reason why is, why is Revelation 19. Jesus Christ is going to ride on a horse, conquer the Antichrist army, United Nations, and then through a sword out of his mouth, just wipe them all out. So look at, and that sword is the word of God. Look at Revelation 19. Notice right here, uh, verse 13. 1913. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the what? Word of God, that's Jesus. But look at verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Like the Bible, right? The Word of God, which is a sharp sword. Yes. That with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Notice how the Word of God, Jesus' name, is associated with this sharp sword that cuts down all these bodies of the army. So it could be more literal than you think. Maybe that's what God had in mind when he said Hebrews 4. All right, go back, Hebrews 4. Notice how this one verse is rich already. 
with so many cross-references, so much you already learned. All right, Hebrews 4.12. The last part, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So uh, the Bible, it discerns. That means it can tell the difference of everything that's going on within your thought pattern and the intents of your heart. That book can, is a mind reader. It's an emotional reader. You cannot escape from it. All right, so go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse 14. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 2 and then verse 14. Now I want you to make this note. This is extremely important. A discerner, what it does, it can always tell the difference between two things even if they are the same. It can tell the difference with two things even if they are the same. That's the reason why, think about this, people are telling you the old lie, all religions are the same. We all believe in Jesus, salvation by faith alone, so it doesn't matter what denomination you are, don't we have pretty much the same doctrine? See, that's the problem with the world. Why? They don't have the Bible. The Bible can tell the difference between two things even though they think they are the same. If you don't know your Bible, then what's going to happen is you're going to assume everybody believes the same thing. Well, that church down over there, that pastor over there, he teaches the same thing like this church and this pastor right here, so they must be the same like us. See, then that shows right here, you have to ask yourself, how much do you know that book? How much do you know that Bible? So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 14. The Bible says here, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So he can, you can only know in the spiritual realm. But if you keep looking at natural things, what's going on in your natural life, in this natural world, that's what scientists boast. They are of naturalism, they say. When you have that mindset, you can't tell the difference. All right, here's another one. Uh, I want you to turn to... Uh, Malachi 3, Malachi 3, and then we'll look at verse 18, Malachi chapter 3, and then verse 18. So how are you doing, Christian? Do you think that pretty much they're all the same? If you do that, if you can't tell dif differences, then you need to look at that book. You don't know that book enough. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. Then shall he return, and look at this, discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. But nowadays people can't tell the difference. They think everyone's serving God in their own ways and that everyone's a wicked or a bad person but serving God in their own ways. That's why they talk about yin and yang. We have a bit of darkness and a bit of light in us, and they're always converging the two. No, they're separated. First Kings 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. This is good, preacher. 1 Kings chapter 3. And then we'll look at verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 3 and then verse 9. This is a very good verse. Solomon, he asked for prayer to judge the people well because he's so young. So he's not confident in his ability to judge well. So he asked for discernment between what is right and wrong here. So go to 1 Kings chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 9. The Bible says right here, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So he needed discernment to, tell, to judge people's matters and tell the difference. Okay, the last one is uh, Ezra 3.13. Ezra 3.13. Here's another good example. The Bible talks about people who gave a great noise. And then there were people who w were weeping, and then there were people who were shouting. But that noise was so loud, they couldn't tell the difference between what was weeping and what was shouting. Mm -hmm. And by, the Bible uses the word discern, see? Yeah. Discern. Sometimes those two things that are different, they, they sound, they look the same. So you have to pray a lot for discernment. Do you pray for discernment? 
That's an important thing to pray for in your everyday life is discernment. The Bible says, Ezra 3.13, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. All right, then. Let's go back to Hebrews 3 again. Let's go back to Amen. Hebrews chapter 3. So the, the, that book is your only thing. Think about it. It's the only thing that can discern. You can't. No matter how strong your rationalist thinking is or how many uh, stuff you study, it don't matter a hill of beans. Solomon, he said at the end, much learning doth make me mad. It's uh, vanity. This is the guy who prayed for discernment from God. So he knows everything that you can study, no matter how much smart you are, you can't discern unless you have God. Yeah. And that, <coughs> and right here, the Bible says, God says it's the book. It's the Bible. If you know that Bible, you're going to tell the difference. The only thing that can tell the difference. All right? All right, now, so then that book can read people's thoughts and feelings, right? Hence, that's why that Bible can judge those saints at the great white throne judgment. It reads their thoughts and their minds. Now, believe it or not, this is personified, the Bible. It's personified as if it's a person judging them. It's so, so closely personified, you could probably guess the person yeah. it will personify itself to. It's Jesus. Amen. So I'm not saying that Jesus is your King James Bible, but they are very close. So the, the, the scholars, the mainstream Orthodox Christians, they poke fun at King James only people that you worship the King James Bible. Well, do you know how God takes bibliolatry so far that you might think it's bibliolatry? He puts the King James Bible so closely aligned with Jesus. Yeah. So I didn't say the King James Bible is Jesus, but it's so close. Oh, blasphemy, right? Yeah, tell that to all the pastors out there, the Christian scholars. And don't get mad at me. Get mad at the book because look at right here. I'll show you. Yeah, come on. Verse 13 Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. So that verse is saying that nobody, so that's what creatures are referring to, all right? It's referring to people. Nobody will, uh, will not be manifested, will not be exposed in his sight. That's not God's sight. That's not God's sight. That's the Bible's sight. Verse 12. Look at the context. Look at the yeah. context. Verse 13 is continuing on the idea of verse 12, that the Bible is reading thoughts and inward feelings. So verse 13 saying the Bible, you can't, uh, it, uh, no person will be free from exposure from his sight, the Bible's sight. Verse 13, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Everything is naked and open. So that means it's exposed mm -hmm. to the eyes of what they assume is God, but it's context scripture. Yep. The on. eyes of the Bible with whom we have to deal with. We have to deal with the Bible at the end, at the judgment. Didn't you know Jesus even said, it's not me that uh, will judge you. It's not God that will judge you, but it's the word that I speak that will judge you at the end. Whew. You want that verse? You want proof? Let's go. John 12. Show this to anybody who accuses you of King James only worship, okay? Go to John 12. No, they're not ready for it. They're not ready for it. Go to John 12. Bibliolatry. Bibliolatry. <laughs> go to John 12. Look at John chapter 12. Verse 47, look what Jesus himself said. You wouldn't believe what he said. This is what Jesus said. John 12, 47. Jesus must have worshipped that King James Bible. Oh, my goodness. John 12, 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Well, then what's going to judge them? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. Okay, who is that person? That's you, Jesus. No, I said I'm not. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Whoa! The word of God is going to judge 
those people at the last day. That's the last day. That's a judgment, great white throne judgment. That's what those books were, remember? Those books are judging them. What are you going to do? Revelation 20 uh, plainly said, every man was judged according to their works, according to the books. The book is judging them. How about that? That's some book, man. Amen. I don't believe it's God, but I wouldn't, but I'd think twice before messing with that book. Right. You have the you have the audacity to play with that thing, huh? Come on. That's something, man. And make money off of it? Yeah. Make on. money off of it? Yeah. Wow. Even James White, who's their favorite King James uh, only critic, admitted that the reason why these Bible translation committees keep making new Bibles is they need to make money. <laughs> you have a clean conscience at the judgment. Wow. Yeah. That's something scary. All right, go back to Hebrews. You want a good reason to become King James only? What you heard tonight. That's right. That will give you much reason on that. All right, there's one more passage I want to show you that the, the Bible is personified. Go to Romans 9, excuse me. Yeah. Romans 9. Notice right here that the scripture is personified right here. Right. Romans 9, 17. This is real funny, okay? So it's, not, uh, so it's not God speaking to Pharaoh here. It's the Bible speaking to Pharaoh, but speaking in the place of God. <laughs> the Bible is speaking in the place of God. Why? Because it's called Word of God. <laughs> it's that simple. All right, Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, what in the world? Yeah, amen. What blasphemy? Bibliolatry, bibliolatry. <laughs> Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. That's God speaking. How dare the Bible takes the place of God? It's his word, dummy. That's why he can speak for God. Right. <laughs> Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So see this? We're not saying this is God, but see how closely aligned it is to God? Because it's God's word. Yes. It's that simple, all right? Would you slap God's lips? No. Come on. His words. What makes that different from his lips? What makes that different from his face? Right. That's a part of him. Yes. You don't mess with this, period. Bibliolatry, my foot. Go back. I'm not saying the Bible is God, but it's the same thing. I'm not saying the face is God, the lip is God, his eye is God, but I wouldn't touch those things either. I wouldn't slap that thing. All right. Go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. All right, here's my favorite part. All right, you're going to get a big blessing out of this. All right. Hebrews 4, and then we'll look at verse 14 here, all right? Let me get a drink. All right, and then follow along. I'm going to explain each and every word. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. All right, I'm going to explain everything, what it means. So the author is saying at verse 14, so we see then that we got a great high priest who already passed, he already passed all throughout the heavens. So that's the sky, that's the universe, up to the third heaven. So all of you know that, three heavens. He went all the way up there, and that is Jesus, the Son of God. So because he's up there, we've, uh, he's encouraging the tribulations Jews to hold fast their profession. So that's where you get about professing salvation. What does that mean? You profess, you claim to be a saved person. So the author is speaking right here. You got to hold on to what you profess to be, a saved believer. So for the tribulation Jews, they have to hold on to what they profess to be, that they are saved believers. Now, remember, that's the context. They have to hold on to their salvation, what they profess to be. Notice the language is again used about holding on when we look at the context right here of uh, verse uh, chapter 3, for example. 
And then notice right here in verse uh, 12, chapter three, uh, 3, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So you got to hold on to the end. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So you got to hold on to the end. So notice that it was repeated again and again. We see another example at chapter 3 and verse 6, verse 6. But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So there's no doubt that's what chapter 4, uh, chapter four verse 14 is talking about. You've got to hold on to your salvation all the way to the end. That's why the tribulation is known as endure to the end. It's called the end, the end times. So when you hear the end, remember that's tribulation. That's not Christian, okay? So if people tell you endure to the end for your salvation, they ain't you. The end is referring to tribulation, all right? We're not at the end right now, okay? <laughs> so in verse 14, the tribulation Jews, they're being encouraged that they have a great high priest who can intercede on their behalf. And that's why they have to just keep enduring the best that they can because he's going to intercede for them. They can come to him through their temptations and sins, actually. You're going to find out in verse 15 and 16 that they're going to come to that high priest Jesus because they're struggling with temptation. It's going to, uh, tribulation is also another word for temptation. I don't know if you knew that. Tribulation is another word for temptation. So as they go through the tribulation, they undergo the temptations, they're going to be discouraged. So the author is telling those tribulation Jews, just hold on best as you can because you got your high priest over there and then he can always intercede on your behalf. He understands the temptations, the hardships you're going through. So just come to him and confess to him. And that is already explained at... Uh, two verses which I gave previously for some of you who don't know. And that was at Revelation chapter 3, and that was 1 John 2. We saw that last time, all right? We saw that last time in Hebrews. You might recall Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, right? Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. It talked about Jesus being their high priest. And if they go through temptation, uh, he will succor them. He will provide their needs, help them. So that matches with 1 John 2, which is a tribulation epistle, that they have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, that they can go to. He can intercede on their behalf. Revelation 3 says, if they just endure, if they just hold fast, he will deliver them from the hour of temptation. So see, that's tribulation. Revelation 3, Revelation is about tribulation. Revelation 12 is another passage we saw last time, which I won't do it again. Revelation 12, during the tribulation, the devil is accusing those tribulation saints day and night of their sins, see? So this is all tribulation context we can see. But if you and I were to read this, we can see something Christian, right? That would be our first thought. It would be Christian, not tribulation Jew. So the author here, he may have intended it. He intended it for tribulation Jews, but God knew that, no, this can actually work for Christians too. So let's look at, at the Christian point of view, okay? So the Christian point of view at verse 14 is that we got a great high priest. So he can intercede our behalf. If he's a high priest, then that means there are lower priests. So then who are the priests? That's you and I. You and I are the priests. Go to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Hyper-dispensationalists, they might claim that, oh, no, no, the priests are referring to some of them, might say those are only for tribulation Jews. That's not true. Notice that John was writing to churches during his timeline. So he's speaking to Christians. Notice churches in his timeline during the church age, he said that we, including himself, are priests. Revelation 1.5. Revelation 1.5. From Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yep. Isn't that you? John said us. Yep. And hath made us kings and what? Priests. Priest. So you and I are priests. 
All right, go back to Hebrews, Hebrews 4. So then Jesus Christ, if he's called high priest, that must mean there are lower priests, and that is referring to us. So verse 15, this is really good. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So let me explain each and every word. In other words, see how my explanation matches verse 15. We don't have an high priest that does not have the feelings that are touched with our feelings, with the weaknesses, the infirmities, uh, the weaknesses that we go through, things that hurt us. Because Jesus Christ, in all points, he went through every scenario going through the same temptations like we did, but he still remained without sin. So Jesus Christ understands your feelings, everything that you go through in temptation. This is a very good verse to encourage yourself when you're going through a hard time. Now think about this. Jesus Christ feels everything that you're feeling right now. So this is important to understand. Listen, you want to listen to this part. If you were to tell me your problem and your pain, all right, I probably would not understand it. I'll try to the best way that I can. I'll empathize and then help you out. But here's the problem. The problem is me and you are very different. So in my mind, I would be thinking that, uh, you know, if I don't understand your pain, well, you know, I don't think it's really that bad like you would say. But the person who's saying it to me feels differently. See that? Because my feeling is different from their feeling, even though I try to feel what they feel. So then that person's feeling is, no, it means a big deal to me. And I'm talking about even, let's talk about a lazy person, a lazy person who should know better, a person who's sinning who should know better, all right? And that person is feeling pain and hardship. I mean, it's even painful for them to just get up out of bed, get out of the house and go out. But to you and I, we would go, you're just lazy. We might try to empathize. We might try to understand, help them out. But to you and me, we go, you're just lazy because we're not feeling yeah. what that person's feeling. Right. But what that person's feeling is real to him or her, even though to us it's not. Right. Jesus Christ is feeling those same things God. that that person is feeling. Yeah. So think about this, okay? So that's why uh, right here, Jesus Christ is touched with our feelings. So when he deals with you, he is never wrong in the way how he deals with you. A lot of times we would think, Lord, why won't you deliver me from this problem? Why won't you deliver me from this temptation? Because remember, his job during temptation is to, uh, in verse 16, verse 16, well, let me explain the whole thing, okay? And then I'll break it apart. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. So the author is saying we should come boldly, so unashamedly. Yes. So with the feelings that you're feeling, you could say it unashamedly to him, even though it's embarrassing, even though it's shameful, even though it makes you look weak and pitiful. Amen. All right? Amen. So you can come boldly to him at that throne because that throne is full of grace. Amen. So God is gracious because he feels what you feel. So then he's going to give you grace at the throne. So you can come boldly to him that we may obtain mercy. So God, he's full of grace. Grace means something that you don't deserve, uh, yet you get it. Yeah. Hasn't God done that with your prayers when you came right. to the throne of grace? Yeah. So that you can also g obtain, you can receive mercy. What does mercy mean? Something you deserve, yeah. but you don't get. In other words, you deserve to be scoffed, belittled, and uh, punished with a request like that maybe to God. Who do you think you are? You know, you, you think that your problem is genuine and real, but it's not. In reality, uh, you're pitiful. In reality, you're weak. Yeah. Come on. But the thing is, is that to God, He feels what you're feeling. Amen. And so He won't give you what you deserve. Thank you, Lord. I mean, think about it. A lot of times you come in with your temptation, your sin, your addiction. You deserved a lot worse than what, you deserve, what you're going through now. That's right. But God gives you mercy, yes. understanding the feelings you're going through. That is priceless. Yes. 
So you get grace and mercy. That's wonderful. (laughs) And find grace to help in time of need. So God will give you grace. You're able to find that grace where it's going to help you during your time of need. So if you're going through your time of need, God's not delivering you from the problem. That's the problem with people. We always go uh, seeking medicine, therapy, sessions, counseling, because we expect it to get rid of the problem. That's not how it works. How it works is God uh, God makes you find the grace to be able to help you during your time of need when you need it. So in other words, it gives you more strength. All right? So it's not relief of it. It's not release of the pain. It's strength for the pain. So a good example is 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now another verse which we won't turn to because we looked at it at our last Hebrew study, but you can write down 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10.13, which is God won't give you a temptation greater than you can bear. But the other one is 2 Corinthians 12. Notice right here, Paul wants to be released, relieved from his pain, but God never releases it. Instead, he gives him grace to go through it, where he has strength to bear it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, verse 9, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory, notice, in my infirmities. Remember what Hebrew said? When you're going through infirmities, notice this verse says, Paul says he's going to gladly be in it. Not stay away from it, not escape from it, but be in it. He's glad to be in it. Why? Because God gives him the grace to go through it. All right. So when we go back, go back to Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4. So this is very important to understand. Christ knows the balance, okay? He knows the balance. This this is the great thing about Jesus Christ. He knows the balance where he's touched with, so he knows exactly what you feel, but he's, when he goes down to where you're feeling, he's not going to stay down there with you, all right? That's a very dark place to be in. When he's going to go down to where you're at in your feelings, And because what is he? He's high priest. He has the authority. He's without sin. See that? He's holy. So if he debases himself down here and leaves you alone down here with your temptations, sin, and the hardship or whatever you're going through, he's debasing himself. You see that? He is not a debased priest. He is a high priest. He is holy priest. So what he does is, He goes down to where you're at, where you're feeling, and he picks you up. He puts you to where he's at. That's what it means to be more like Christ. Christ, remember this, Christ's job is not to be more like you. If you in your prayers expect Christ to be more like you with your woes, your sorrows, your pains and all that, then you're debasing Christ. And not only that, you're, you're not getting any help. Down there? You think you're going to get help down there? No. You need to be put up. You need to have grace and strength to go through it. Because Christ in his temptations, he went through the same temptations all of you go through. The pain. He knows exactly how that feels. But Christ never made that an excuse to succumb to temptation and weakness. Do you understand that? He, He endured the cross. He didn't run away from it. But we want to run away from the cross, don't we? From our pain. But Christ didn't. So see, Christ exactly understands what you and I are feeling because he felt that. But he also realizes that you and I don't understand about taking our cross, accepting our cross, going through it. So his job is to go down there where your feelings are at and then make sure he doesn't stay down there with you, but pulls you up to where he's at to conquer the temptation. If there's something that you want, you want to conquer the temptation, not run away from the temptation. That's the thing. We think that we can be free from temptations. No, temptation will remain 24-7. You're never going to get a perfect life, no matter how much you pray for it. You're not going to get that. You're never going to break free from it. The best thing to do is to fight it. 
to learn how to accept it and overcome it, manage it. So that's Christ's job, is to, for, is to endure the cross. So that's the genius thing about Jesus Christ when you go to Hebrews 4. Notice right here, verse 15, all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So he's not going to stay down there with you, okay? So he's going to remain holy and high priest, but at the same time, he can go down to where you're at, what you're feeling. That's only God can do that. Now, if Christ can do that balance, here's another thing. Aren't we Christians supposed to follow Christ? If we're supposed to follow Christ, the best verses for counseling and for anyone who does psychology or whatever is this verse. Psychology and counseling is all about empathy, all right? And I majored in that one. I studied in that one. So they empathize with the client's feelings. But the problem uh, with the psychologists is that they stay down with that empathy where those clients are at. No, you don't leave them down there. That's dangerous. Uh, what God wants is you need to get out of there. You need to mature. You need to grow up out of that. So what's so important, this is quite a balance. So in our case, you know what our problem is? Our problem is because we think we're high priest, see? We're very spiritual like Jesus. When we deal with people, we fight. We get bitter. We look down on them. We judge them. Well, you're just lazy, brother. Well, you're just uh, weak, brother. Well, you're just an uh, emotional sister or whatever like that. And here's the thing. You don't want to end up like that. Now, are there times, you know, uh, you know me. I'm a straight preacher. You know, I'll tell it to your face if I have to, all right? So I don't shy away from that. But I don't believe that you should have no heart. Every pastor has a heart and should have a heart. Otherwise, you're not fit to be a pastor. Come on. So the thing is this, is that the, you know how you avoid uh, problems in churches? The thing is this, you're not touched with their feelings. You know why people fight in church? You're in touch with your own feelings. You're not in touch with their feelings. Now, here's the thing, is that if you think, well, they should be spiritual, they got to grow up, they got to mature and stuff like that. Hey, man, I'm glad Jesus Christ didn't do that with you, huh? He can be in touch with his own feelings and get on you for not being in touch with his own feelings. But Jesus Christ is willing to set that aside, be in touch with your feelings. The most effective thing that I've learned as a pastor to preach, teach, to convince people, so in, counsel and all that, is to be in touch with their feelings. When you do that, it's powerful. Uh, one person said it this way, which was very good. He says, you know, people won't remember what you say or what you preach, but they'll remember how you made them feel. That's very, very telling right there. So the thing is this. If you want to uh, conquer bitterness and you want to conquer jealousy, uh, look at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. These are very good verses. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Well, I'm just bitter at that person in the church, Pastor. I just can't get over it. And then, well, then uh, you got this problem. You're, in, you're so much in tune with your emotions. And you want that other person to understand your emotions, what you're feeling. You know what that's called? That's called selfishness. You know what you should do? You got to be in touch with their emotion and cast aside your emotions. No Christian wants to do that. You know why? Every Christian is selfish because they think they're right, especially if they think that they're spiritual, that they're in the right. And that's a dangerous place to be in because Jesus never did that with you and I. Now go to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. The Bible says, uh, Romans chapter 12. Notice in verse 15. Notice the... Uh, in tune with the emotions, right? Verse 15, rejoice with them that what? Do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the what? Same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. See, that's your problem. You're too high. You think you're spiritual. No, you got to go down to where they're at. But condescend to men of low estate. I told you so. Go down to where they're at. 
so you can be in the same mind together. But you refuse to because you're so spiritual and you're a Bible believer and you're a pastor and everybody looks up to you and hogwash, man. You make me sick. Now, I do that because there are some Bible-believing pastors guilty of that. And they make quick assumptions and quick judgments, and they expect their members to understand what they're doing and how they do things. And if they don't, that's the fault of the members. And then they just uh, they wonder why their church goes through splits and people talk bad about the pastor. All right? So that's a horrible thing with uh, spiritual people nowadays. All right? Verse 16 says, Be not wise in your own conceits. All right, go to 1 Corinthians 12. And that includes the members too, all right? Yeah, the members, yeah. the problem is they always think about themselves. That's why they walk out of church often and mad. That's why they fight with each other. And they'll fight about the silliest things, and they expect the pastor to get involved in that, and they can't be grown enough adults to get over it. You know why? They're all in touch with their feelings, their feelings. You see these uh, peaceful, so-called peaceful protests? You know what that is? An example of selfishness because they demand people to understand their feelings. You know what happens when you do that? You become demon-possessed. You want to see demon-possessed people? People who are high on their own emotions and demand other people to understand their own emotions. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's probably the smartest thing I ever said tonight, all right? I, I say a lot of dumb stuff, but that's the smartest thing that I ever said. Remember that, all right? <laughs> all right. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice right here, verse uh, 25. Now, we're called what? One body of Christ. What does that mean if we're all the same body? We should all have the same thought patterns and feelings and everything. We should feel what they feel. The finger shouldn't be a rebel and demand the foot. You got to feel what I'm feeling right here. Yeah. Don't do that. All right. First Corinthians chapter 12. Notice verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. It has the same function. If someone suffers, then you suffer with it. Do you know why God puts you and I through suffering? Do you know why Hebrew says he went through the same sufferings like we did? Do you know why? So we can share the same empathy. You know what God did in my life? He put me through incredible sufferings and unique circumstances where it helped me a lot to be compassionate and empathetic with people. Yeah, suffering's good for you. Go to first, 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Notice right here, suffering helps you with empathy. If you don't have empathy toward other people, you haven't suffered. All right? You're too used to a high position and people looking up to you, and you got to get off of that. You're too used to people feeding you comfort. Go to 2 Corinthians 1. Notice right here, uh, the Bible says, in verse six, uh, verse 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. How about that? All right, go back to Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews. So how is your empathy toward other people. You've got to learn that. And then, trust me, bitterness, division in church will go away. Amen. All right? So if you're having trouble with bitterness, jealousy, or division with brethren, then you need to practice those verses that I've given out to you. Okay? You've got to put aside your emotions, your thinking, and try to understand that person's emotion, that person's feelings. Even secular psychologists understand that. You know, they go to the the client's background, what they're going through, try to hear them out, listen to them rather than listening to themselves. So that's why the client feels empathized, feels helped. So you got to learn to do that yourself, all right? You want people to listen to you. You don't want to listen to them. That's your problem. But at the same time, it doesn't come to a point where you spoil them, right? Because you listen, you help them, but it balances where you refuse to stay down there with them. 
See? So that's a great balance. So then when I counsel people, it helped me a lot to not be up here but down there. But I don't stay down there. When, once I get down there with them, I try to pick them, bring them up, knowing their broken state. So I'm careful how I pick them up. When there's a broken, sh uh, shattered uh, vase over there, you don't just pick it up carelessly. You pick it up very carefully. And at least you pick it up. You mend it carefully. You don't just do it, hey, just work, just glue each other. No, you do it carefully. That's the same thing you do when you mend a person and you pick them up. You don't leave them broken. You don't go down there and stay down there. You pick them up. But when you pick it up, you pick it up carefully. You pick it up with empathy. You pick it up with understanding. Sometimes when a stubborn piece just won't go in, then you use a little force. See that? Then you use a little force. Okay. Uh, oh, man, I have to finish tonight. I didn't finish everything. But I want to show you something really important. There are people, here's another problem, there are people who are over empathetic and that is a problem. I've seen that in our church before too. I've seen that with my own life before too. That is a horrible mistake. You don't want to do that, all right? Because what it does is then they're keeping grabbing you with their victim mentality and they expect you to always uh, follow them up, give them money, help them out, talk to them, and then be with them all the time on the phone, and then you don't want them to take advantage of you because you know what you're doing? You're staying down there with them. They refuse to come up. So how do we balance that part out? Next time, all right? So this is the one that I want to talk about. This is very eye-opening. There's a thing where you don't tell, you don't spill the beans to everybody you talk to. All right, there's a good reason for it. There's boundaries for a reason. Even psychologists talk about it. They make a very big deal on boundaries in spite of empathy. Yeah. They make a very strict rules on boundaries for good reason. We'll talk about that one, all right? Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. We learned a lot and that uh, we'll learn to be of the same mind, same body, and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.